Almost as long as there have been cars, there have been trucks. In the beginning, trucks were crude, primitive, and limited in what they could do. Trucks slowly evolved, and by the 1940s and 1950s, big rigs were becoming a familiar sight on all of the nation's highways. And in the past 20 years, the big rigs we see hauling close to 90% of every consumer product we all use every day have borne little resemblance to their early ancestors. Trucks are a living legacy of the story of American transportation. There are trucks, truck drivers, and truck lovers in every corner of the world. And this is the story of an event which gathered hundreds of them together for a fantastic five-day affair in the spring of 1991. This was the 20th annual convention of the American Truck Historical Society. The site for the 1991 convention was the best western hotel in Marlboro, Massachusetts, about 35 miles west of Boston. Although the truck show wasn't scheduled until Saturday and Sunday, on Wednesday, May 22nd, registration began, and trucks of every year make and model covering eight decades were both driven and trailered to the parking lot outside the hotel. Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, slowly but surely, the parking lot outside the hotel gradually began to fill up with trucks. It was safe to say at this point that by the time the weekend arrived, the ATHS would be looking at one of their most successful and well-attended conventions. The ATHS is based in Birmingham, Alabama, and was founded in 1971, an international club dedicated to the collection and preservation of trucks and their history. Larry Sheaf is a regional vice president of the ATHS and was also the convention manager. He shared some of the background and goals of the ATHS and its annual get-together. Our convention includes a truck show. These truck shows were incorporated in our convention program in the mid-70s, along with a magazine called Wheels of Time. As you can see here, this particular convention is highlighted by having the, a truck similar to one that's owned by the Society. It had been donated to the Society. We include it on the cover of our magazine. The Society is now growing in size by approximately 1,000 new members per year, up to the current 12,003 membership. This particular convention has drawn 600, approximately 650 trucks. Not all this size. Many of them Model A Ford types. Uh, Max are very dominant here, Sterlings. But uh, this group of men and women that enjoy restoring these trucks or driving one in that isn't even restored yet, they like it still in its original condition. Uh, gather also in local chapters. We have 45 chapters across the country in ver you know, various areas. The conventions are held in one of three sections and it changes each year from the west coast to the central to the eastern area. Next year we're going to be in Portland, Oregon. The following year Milwaukee and the following year Buffalo. We're getting to the size where not only do we have a problem in the hotel accommodating our group, but uh, the parking facilities uh, mean that we're eventually going to have to start holding these affairs in fairgrounds. That really is a concern. But we have uh, approximately 375 members in Canada. We have members in Europe that uh, several editors of trucking magazines in that uh, area. I don't know that we have anybody here from the Orient, but they're here covering our show. The trucks that are here will give you an idea of the wide range of uh, people that uh, are interested in this. They aren't all truckers. Myself, I've been a loan officer most of my life, and I don't own a truck. But many of us do own one truck. Some of us own several trucks. But it's just like other clubs like the Model A Club. They gather together on weekends. They have fun. We draw the public in so that they can have fun with us. And the real fun was yet to come. On Saturday and Sunday, May 25th and 26th, the 1991 ATHS convention would turn its total attention to the centerpiece event of the week, the truck show. The weekend arrives in central New England. It's sunny and hot in the 90s. 
and the hotel parking lot is overflowing with trucks. It's showtime. Even a duck, along with hundreds and hundreds of trucks, in what had to be the largest gathering of vintage trucks ever assembled in New England. As Larry Sheaf had indicated, over 600 trucks did indeed take part in this exceptional exhibition of muscular machinery. The estimated 5,000 people who visited the show each day were treated to a three-dimensional travelogue which carried them through 80 years of trucking history. There are many, many museums around the world that would have been envious of the antique trucks which appeared here on this spring afternoon. This is the way Mack trucks looked back in 1922. This fully restored flatbed worked many a construction job as American industry forged ahead in the pre-depression years. Driver comfort was in short supply, thanks to solid rubber tires on a rigid leaf spring undercarriage. And there was chain drive. Nearby a 1925 International, as clean as the day it was built. And back in the 30s, the White Motor Company was building these, the White 621 Dump. Few people are alive today who will remember the Vim. This 1917 open delivery is owned by Paul DePold of Marilla, New York. The Vim truck was made in Philadelphia, PA. Uh, they were in business from 1914 through 1923. This was probably their 17 was probably their highest production year. They supposedly made 13,000 that year. I don't know too much of the history of this truck. I've owned it for about five years now. Uh, it was basically, I would assume, a, a store delivery truck or something like that originally, but uh, what it was used for later on in life, I have no idea. I don't plan to restore it. I'm going to leave it just the way it is, just on account of it being an original yet. It was pretty much original anyway. Uh, I just don't want to restore it. The Vim featured this primitive oil pressure gauge, a finned wheel suspended in oil. With the engine running, if there was oil pressure, the wheel would spin. Almost 80 years ago, concrete trucks looked like this. It's a 1915 Mack Pup, owned by Howard Blades of Ashland, Massachusetts. An antique truck lover felt like a kid in a candy store. Okay, I'll climb it out. Okay. Look at this beautiful 1926 Ford Wrecker. A 1929 Rio Speedwagon pickup. A rare 1931 Mack chain drive tandem axle tractor. And right next door, a beautifully restored 1922 Mack flare side. The owners of this fine vintage truck, the Humphreys of Gray, Maine, also brought along this equally impressive 1928 Sterling dump, detailed to perfection. And their 1927 Mack high lift dump, painted an eye catching red with contrasting yellow chassis and pinstripe. This all-original, unrestored 1914 Case is owned by Ron Rolfe of Schoharie, New York. If you've never heard of Case trucks, there's a reason. Case really never built a truck commercially. This originally was a touring car. The body burned in 1915. The man that I purchased it from built this body in 1917. So he converted it into a truck in 1917 and used it until 1930. And it runs nice. It's uh, mechanically as perfect as you can get, untouched mechanically. 
and I'm going to have fun with it just like it is. All the way from Dayton, Virginia, Lewis Clemmer's 1918 International. It was owned originally by the farmer who hauled his farm produce with it, went to another owner, and I am the third owner of it. Was restored to this condition about 18 years ago. The fenders were filthy and rusty. A lot of filler on them, a lot of rubbing, a lot of sanding. I had a lot of help. While Lewis Clemmer's top-notch restoration team poses with the finished product, let's quickly take a look at a few more of the antique trucks which were on display at the ATHS convention. There was this sunshine yellow 1919 Packard, accompanied by a matching 1926 Bulldog Mac, another of the many trucks on display with chain drive. A rare 1932 Macar, original and unrestored. This 1931 Ford dump truck provided a makeshift rest area for its owner from Laconia, New Hampshire. And Bill Westcott of Cape Cod told us how he came by this 1930 Ford light utility. Well, I just happened to be at a Model A Ford meeting one time and uh, I heard somebody talking about an old truck and they didn't want it because it was too bad off. So I just uh, kind of listened a little while and uh, I uh, finally got the uh, telephone number of the fellow that just bought it from the hospital. Uh, I was going for junk, so I contacted him, and uh, he held me up for $135. So when I retired, I spent a full year on it and restored it, and it's probably the only one in the country like it. Unlike the antique car phenomenon, which has become as much an investment game as a hobby, the owners of the collectible trucks which took part in the show spoke little of what their trucks were worth or how much they would sell them for. Although Ed Ashcroft, who owns this gorgeous 1950 Ford pickup, has a ready answer when asked if it's for sale. Yes, everything's for sale. You got $25,000, it's yours. <laughs> and despite the fact that the members of the ATHS had obviously spent a tremendous amount of time preparing their trucks for display, this show differed from the usual show procedures of other clubs in that there were no judges and no voting. Larry Sheaf. This particular show, unlike many, does not have trophies. Most of the men that put these together, along with help from their wives who might be doing the upholstery, uh, love their particular truck. They might love it for what it looks like in the condition that they get it. So we don't have trophies. We don't have a best of show. We don't have a first place. We don't have a second place. They're all respected equally. And my truck, if I buy one, is going to be a Model A Ford ice truck, whether it's all restored or not. But we just don't believe in the trophy concept. And uh, personally, I, uh, I, don't, I don't think that's necessary in it becoming a better show. It would be hard to imagine a better selection of original and restored trucks ever having been assembled in one place. Here are more of them. A 1951 Mack tractor. Another Mack. This one in 1954, with chestnut brown paint and plenty of chrome and stainless steel. A 1965 B-Series Mac with twin screws. And a 1976 D600 Mac with twin screws and offset cab. This 1934 Ford Wrecker got plenty of attention. There was a rare white Freightliner twin screw straight job. And this Model A steak truck sounded like it was in pretty good running condition. Bay Stater Ted Philkins told us the story behind his beautiful 1951 Brown. We started in our own shop. We did it in last September. And it's, there was only about a thousand of them built between 1939 and 1952. We don't know of any others that have ever been restored in the nation whatsoever. And we just finished it last Friday. And it, when we bought it, it was junk. And the reason I bought it to restore it was I had a sentimental value. I had, used to drive one just like it when I was a lot younger than I am now. Back in 1973, when we were all a bit younger, a new Dodge rollback flatbed looked like this. And 10 years earlier, if you had a big towing job, you might have needed a Kenworth like this. And around the same time, Ford's HD 1000 was a popular choice for long-haul operations. And the town or county where you lived probably had one or two of these Ford N600 dumps. One of the many Mack dumps on hand was this 1965 V81 10-wheeler, owned by Jolin Paving and Excavating from Worcester, Massachusetts. 
and parked right next door down from New Hampshire was this spotless 1954 Chevy flatbed dump. Two ultra-clean B61 Mack tractors, this 1965 owned by the Fabians of Vermont, and this 1961 owned by the Ohms of Pennsylvania. Here's a 1958 B42 owned by Sandy and Donna Tanner, and it's immaculate. And if you know your trucks, you already know who this character is. It's the infamous Dodge Ram, and he's presiding over the hood of this 1955 Dodge tractor, complete with a sleeper berth. A 1959 Brockway. This one, a Brockway Husky. And if you're a baby boomer, maybe you were born in 1949. So was this fire engine red Chevy pickup. Before we take a look at many, many more of the trucks that were headlining the 1991 ATHS convention truck show, we should mention that this year's event boasted an endless selection of vendors who in some cases traveled long distances with auto and truck memorabilia, souvenirs, specialty items, and, well, you name it. Larry and Elaine Feedy came all the way from Bloomington, Illinois, and their table was one of the busiest at the 1991 ATHS convention. What we do is take the antique vintage little toy vehicles and customize them and put uh, people's business cards or their company logos on them uh, at their request. And uh, we have the little antique gas pumps that go with them and uh, other types of uh, antique truck memorabilia. We, uh, we also get involved in some farm toys, restoration, and that type of thing back in Illinois. Along with Larry and Elaine scale miniatures, you could find all kinds of things in the vendor area, like official ATHS apparel, and almost as many toy trucks as there were the real thing. Many of these metal trucks have become real collector's items in the last 40 or 50 years. In fact, it was a show within a show because of the many downsized kitty rigs popping up everywhere. That's the same emblem we saw earlier on some antique Macs. This is a Mac, but this one features pedal power. And the people from Horseless Carriages Auto Transport feature this mini museum on wheels. Inside, there were several valuable antique pedal cars proudly displayed. Parked outside was something really special. Pete Goulet of nearby Blackstone built this fabulous Mack tractor and trailer powered by a lawnmower engine for his son Matthew. Originally it was a lawnmower, riding mower, and uh, we stretched it out a little bit, made a go-kart, and then he outgrew it. So we started adding on an extra set of wheels, a roof, and one thing led to another. We stole pots from refrigerators and washing machines, and that's the end result. The grill is from a refrigerator shell, and the Oh, the bumper is from a bumper off an old truck, and the uh, radiator is a seat bracket from an old tractor. Well, it'll go about 25 miles an hour in high speed. Nearby, another vehicle built for kids, but this one a bit bigger and a lot older. Dick Holmes of Norfolk, Massachusetts is the owner. Uh, we bought it from Bonstable Bus Company on Cape Cod. We restored it in our own shop. It's a 1932 Ford Model BB, which means it has a four-cylinder engine. Well, it's actually one of the last four cylinders, and the 32 Ford went to a V8 about halfway through the year. Although these are downsized, they are not for kids. George Sprow brought these two Mac hotshots down from Maine. Mac bodies and running gear built onto a homemade chassis. This showgoer was obviously very intrigued, while a mural on the back of one of them makes a very strong statement. In fact, the venerable Mac was by far the most well-represented truck make at the show, and several were unquestionably unique. This clean 1939 Mac, which didn't quite pass this enthusiast's white glove inspection, belongs to Tom Spencer of Warren, New Jersey. Uh, I purchased it from a fellow in New Brunswick, New Jersey in 1986 and it took me about three years to restore the truck part-time. Uh, we have a gas engine and winch combination on the back of the truck that is a domestic engine built in 1912. The engine and winch combination have been together since 1912. They came off a barge that was used I assume around New York Harbor uh, for many many years. 
Of course, when I finished the truck, it was an ideal place to put the engine and winch on there. Being they use a winch like that for rigging, it fit right into the theme on a rigger's truck. And look at that, a hand-carved Mack Bulldog occupying the spot where the fifth wheel would normally be on the B-Series tractor owned by Lance Fillmore of Boxboro, Massachusetts. The warm, humid weather required some real ingenuity in finding a comfortable place to rest. And with several acres packed solid with some of the rarest, most beautifully restored, and menacing vehicles to hit New England in a long time, this was one show where you had to take whatever time was necessary to be sure you didn't miss anything. It would be hard to pick out the most unusual item we discovered at the show, but this would have to be close to it. The Walter Hyman Ironworks trailered in a handmade revolving unisphere built from hundreds of pieces of scrap iron. If you were looking for your own restoration project, you could have picked up this 1947 GMC or this 1957 Walter Snowfighter. Scott Schwanger brought a couple of real show pieces all the way up from Pennsylvania that were stunning. A pair of fully restored Peterbilt conventionals, a 1944 and a matching 1965. The 1944 model was outfitted with an ingenious device that many a trucker back in the 40s could have used. Back in the 40s, they didn't have, they didn't have engine brakes. Um, they, and coming down the hills, they, they heated the brakes up pretty bad. So these guys would, these guys would mount, well, this is a 220 gallon fuel oil tank that, that they would mount it on a rig and it has valves and piping that runs underneath and it has four nozzles, one at each brake and they would open the valves a little bit at the top of each hill on both sides. It would, it would run water down over the brake drums and it would help cool the brakes on the way down the hill. Don Rogers trucked all the way down from Ontario, Canada in this immaculate 1954 GMC tractor, pulling an equally clean 1954 Great Dane reefer. The tractor is a, what they call a cannonball. It was quite a famous truck back in the 50s. They made uh, movies off it uh, called the Cannonball Express, I believe. The trailer is a Great Dane trailer, and uh, I purchased it from uh, a chap down in uh, Littitz, Pennsylvania and it's the oldest Great Dane trailer in the United States that runs highways. There was variety, more variety, <laughs> and even more variety. Scores and scores of trucks of every year and model. There were plenty of Mack dumps, like this 1961 B61, and lots of pieces of heavy equipment that looked ready to begin work on the next new interstate. 
As the saying goes, there were plenty of big toys for big boys. Bob Gaucher of Ballston Lake, New York, brought his expertly restored 1925 Brockway. We found it about 10 years ago in a junkyard, and it was uh, been stored outside for 23 years, been a total restoration uh, from frame up. Uh, we did all the work myself. Uh, been a lot of time, a lot of effort, but it's been worth it. Uh, I think probably when it was new, it was uh, around $1,500 a value, and I think today it's between uh, 15 and 20,000. If you did a stretch with Uncle Sam, the sight of this truck couldn't help but bring back a few memories. And look at the paint job on this 1937 Mack Jr. pickup, owned by the Eilers Brothers of Reedsboro, Vermont. That's right, a Mack Jr., a truck builder which today isn't readily associated with the pickup truck market. This one was absolutely pristine. A year later, in 1938, Dodge Canopy pickups looked like this one, owned by the Rivers family of Fitchburg, Massachusetts. As we watched this old international six-wheel dump go by, we figured it had had some last-minute paint detailing. How could we tell? The overspray on the mud flaps. Here was a rare piece, a 1955 Mac D42 high-lift dump with elevated cab. For ease of maintenance, this truck was the way to go. Back when Eisenhower was president and many homes were heated with coal, trucks like this one were a welcome sight when the bin was getting empty. Gordon Holdsworth's big black 1987 auto car came in handy so he could flatbed in his 1973 auto car 10-wheeler. Here's a real rags to riches story. This 1952 Sterling was found in the woods rotting away until the James Flett Construction Company rescued it and performed this masterful restoration job on it. If you're a student of old trucks, you might remember the name Federal. This 1951 model belongs to Bud and Ramona Ritz of Sylvania, Ohio. And we noticed all eyes seemed to be on the Blue Goose. A beautifully restored 1932 white horse carry, complete with cargo. Marvin Comer from Baltimore, Maryland brought a really unique exhibit and his son Jack told us all about it. Well, the vehicle we're in is uh, a 67 uh, International chassis with a Bowyer Town body. Uh, they made these for the moving, mostly for the moving and storage companies. We were going to use an antique vehicle, but for moving around the country and so have, we uh, decided to use this vehicle because it's a little bit more dependability. And the vehicles you see in this, for the most part, are hand built by a fella, uh, Matty Jordan. And he built these, and he lived in Jersey. And most of these trucks, he worked for a lot of these companies and, and worked in the area where most of these companies are from. And these are all from what he remembers growing up and trucking himself. And that's why the names are on them and the type of trucks they are. It's what his, his, you know, he built them from what he grew up with. The majority of them are scratch built out of balsa wood and some parts out of some other models. And there is a... Uh, a uh, dozen of them that are very unique toys built by a couple manufacturers. We've been collecting through the years and uh, any one of them you can pick out and have a different price with. If you want to, you know, uh, some of these tractor and trailer models, some of them are worth $1,000 or better. This exhibit right just the way they are, all the models are glued down in these glass cases and everything's sealed so nothing moves. Hopefully they don't move. Back in 1954, if you wanted something moved, this would do it in style. A Diamond T twin screw long wheelbase conventional with extended sleeper and sizzling red paint. And whatever isn't red is either chrome or polished alloy, like the diamond plate running boards, the back of the sleeper berth, and the skid plate behind the fifth wheel. And this truck was a real show favorite. A beautiful bright yellow 1950 GMC flatbed steak, which came all the way from Plymouth, California, owned by Howard and Kay Kirkland. There were crowds gathered around this beautiful truck all weekend long. We noticed the name Jaworski from Canterbury, Connecticut adorning several fantastically turned out trucks. One was this 1937 Mack chain drive dump. Notice the beautiful detailing on this fine piece of workmanship.
And we also noticed the Jaworski name on a 1939 Mack heavy construction tractor parked nearby. Once again, the legendary Mack chain drive rear end. And a friendly wave from up in the cockpit. Another truck bearing the Jaworski name was this piece, which was truly rare. A 1964 International Heavy Duty Tractor, which began life as a tank retriever in the armed forces. Owner Jim Jaworski talked more about it. It was a military tank retriever. It's got the same engine in it as a TD-25 bulldozer. It's basically, it was built for the military, but it's basically the same as the international pay hauler. And why the name Tank Retriever? Well, haul the tanks around, a big low bed in back of it, and I used to haul the tanks around with them. Model A lovers truly admired this 1934 Ford pickup wearing jet black paint and powered by a venerable Ford flathead adorned with Edelbrock heads. It was spotless from bumper to bumper. So was this 1949 Ford F1 pickup, which received a ground-up restoration. Also flathead powered, it's owned by a very proud Bob Fortin. Although they're almost as big as a truck, <laughs> no, this Lincoln Stretch limo wasn't part of the show. But everyone couldn't help but break into a smile when a happy bride and groom arrived, having booked their reception at the hotel on the very same weekend as the truck show. <laughs> Best of luck, kids. After tossing a little rice on the way back to the exhibition area, it occurred to us to get a closer look at the many vintage fire trucks that were on display. This old timer was museum quality, a 1914 white with incredible detailing everywhere you looked. Peter Faneth of Southborough, Massachusetts, told us about his prized possession. This is a 1936 Peter Parrish fire engine. It was purchased by the town of Danvers. It was, actually money was appropriated for it in 1935. It was purchased in 1936 for $7,000. It was the first, I understand it was the first fire engine that Peter Parrish sold in New England. It was originally uh, run by Danvers from, there's a first line engine, very active engine running 10 to 12 runs a day between 1936 and 1964. And when they originally bought it, they traded it in for a 1912 Knox was the engine that it replaced. This was the first truck that the town of Danvers had that had a windshield. Um, the original engine was a uh, six-cylinder Waukesha, a 517 cubic inch displacement with a four-speed transmission. This truck has a 600 gallon a minute midship hail pump that functions very well as of this day. It's in extremely good condition. Um, it's got a uh, single speed Timken rear end, dual wheels. Uh, a year ago in January, myself and my two sons, PJ and Adam, uh, started to restore it. We uh, completely took it apart, sandblasted the entire frame and all the components, um, primed and repainted them. This is a Centauri Red. It's a 1956 uh, Rally Red that Corvette used. It is, uh, could be used as a serviceable fire truck. It, it's still uh, very much in service. It still has the capability of pumping 600 gallons a minute, carries 118 gallons of water capable of carrying the hose and all the necessary accoutrements for uh, fighting a fire. These two old veterans span three decades of firefighting, a 1934 Ford American LaFrance and a 1953 Studebaker. This 1924 American LaFrance belongs to Michael Tremblay of Biddeford, Maine, and it was an outstanding example of a first-class restoration. The paint was flawless. Every piece of brass and chrome was painstakingly polished. And there were many, many man hours of labor represented by the high gloss waxing that all of the wooden components exhibited. And you can only speculate how many fire alarms this beautiful 1924 American LaFrance fire engine responded to in its long lifetime. Back in the roaring 20s, any young boy with an imagination surely dreamed of wailing to a fire aboard this beauty. In fact, there were probably a few young girls 
who did the same thing. Another fire engine from the 20s, a 1923 Rio Speedwagon, owned by R.S. Bosworth of Bristol, Rhode Island. And I guess we just couldn't resist giving the hand crank siren a quick run through. That's Bob Siegel from Georgetown, Massachusetts and his 1929 Bickle. It was built in Woodstock, Ontario, Canada, and uh, from all the research that I've been able to do, it's the only one that's come across the border into the United States of a custom series. Uh, Bickle also made some stuff on uh, commercial chassis like Rio's and that sort of stuff, but they built this truck entirely themselves. They were uh, Aaron's Fox dealer, which is a big name in early fire trucks, and then they started making this version, so it's a little bit Aaron's Fox, and it's a little bit of theirs, and they just kind of uh, went from there with a little bit lower priced truck to sell to people in Canada. Uh, as far as I've been able to tell it, this truck has uh, come from Ontario, someplace in Ontario. I don't know what town it's from, but uh, I've found that there's uh, 12 trucks like this in Can throughout Canada that have been restored. So I got hope to find them where it came from. Bob says the Bickle will eventually be completely restored. Later, he was preparing for a leisurely lap of the showgrounds. A leaking spark plug wire and a leaking radiator aside, Bob and the Bickle looked and sounded pretty stout as they motored by. And wherever you find fire engines, you can usually find kids. The ATHS truck show is a family affair. A lot of these men did establish a business with the aid of a truck, and their children now are carrying on for them. They want their children to remember what their own personal background was. And so when the child comes along and participates in this, uh, hopefully they'll carry on the same idea and for the betterment of the society. But it is a family participation group. After strolling the entire parking lot outside the hotel, if you thought you'd seen everything, you were mistaken. The Royal Plaza Trade Center was filled with a, well, truckload of even more tremendous exhibits. Under the bright lights of the Trade Center, the shining paint and shimmering bright work on trucks spanning the entire history of transportation made for a colorful mosaic of motor trucking. Here was a place where time almost stood still, as the many showgoers could patiently examine each vehicle and take in all the finer details of the many expert restorations on display. And you needn't be a full-fledged truck devotee to appreciate the care and craftsmanship that was represented here. Some of the trucks parked inside this building are not only rare, but in some cases one of a kind, a testament to the devotion of the members of the ATHS. Several antique trucks immediately caught our eye, such as this colorful 1925 Mack oil tanker. This genuine antique brass oil lamp is hanging from a fully restored 1923 Maxim fire engine. And this was a showstopper. You may remember Bob Valpy of Santa Harbor, New Hampshire. He was recently featured on the cable network series Wild About Wheels. He's a vintage racer of his number nine Allard sports car. Well, this spectacular 1937 Indianapolis Roadster is also Bob's. And so is the truck that it's riding on an equally spectacular 1936 Studebaker steak truck. The indoor vendor area, like the outdoor, offered a wide array of merchandise, including a varied assortment of great looking scale model cars and trucks. Good thing this pickup has a spare. And what kid wouldn't love to browse around this place? In fact, you don't have to be a kid to like scale miniatures like this. This vendor had a videotape presentation playing that explained in detail how their product could increase the safety and efficiency of anyone's big rig. Something they call the laser dot tandem aligner. Something that was a little less high tech was this Deepco milk truck owned by the Hood Milk Company. Of course, it was only a half pint compared to the full size edition that was parked right next to it. A youngster considering a career as a milkman had a chance to try it out. In fact, there were a couple of versions there. The hood milk cow patiently stood watch over the other kitty truck on display, painted in genuine hood milk livery, cream and maroon. These miniature milk trucks are actually antiques that were built some 40 years ago. 
This little guy wanted to be sure that old number 875 was built to last. A quick check inside, a last minute check of the dashboard, and it's off to new discoveries. Having unraveled the question, what has a horn and gives milk? And speaking of nourishment, everyone remembers that old saying about always eating where all the trucks are parked? Well, the ATHS food concession had plenty of delicious picnic style food like hamburgers and hot dogs, whoops. And the roomy tent provided a welcome resting spot out of the hot sun and a chance to mingle a little with other truck lovers who had come from all four corners of the trucking world. And this truck show had the perfect music. This 1930 Model A steak truck, owned by Irving and Lynn Bickford of Yarmouth, Maine, was carrying a payload consisting of a fully operational, self-propelled military band organ. And on the other side of the show area was this equally enchanting concert band organ. With this old-fashioned music playing and the sight of so many vintage trucks sitting in the afternoon sun, you could almost sense that these treasured vehicles had personalities all their own and that they were enjoying the camaraderie and companionship of this event as much as the people were. Late afternoon, Sunday, May 26th, and the show area at the ATHS convention slowly begins to empty out. One by one, empty spaces appear, where only a few moments ago, a truck from America's past had been quietly sitting. During the past four days, new acquaintances have been made, old acquaintances have been renewed, and a great spirit of sharing and socializing has touched the thousands of truck lovers who had come to Marlboro, Massachusetts for this very special reunion. But now, it is nearing its conclusion, and the goodbyes have begun. For some, it's a fairly easy task to load up. But for others, with more sizable rolling stock, it takes almost a minute to join showpiece with trailer. And while the larger trucks, like the tank retriever, will have to be towed home on a trailer, the smaller trucks, like this GMC pickup, are simply driven home. And for those with more than one truck, getting home becomes a family affair. The ATHS convention has once again given truck lovers from North America and beyond their own unique opportunity to celebrate their deep abiding connection to the fact and folklore surrounding the truck and its role in America's prosperity. Next year, in 1992, the convention will be in Portland, Oregon, which means it will be several years before the members in this region will have the chance to get together again. But the memories of the 20th annual ATHS convention will surely hold this truck-loving fraternity tightly united until then.
Larry Sheep with a closing reminder. If you know of anybody in your area that uh, is involved in a chapter, of course, you can uh, join the society through them. It's $20 a year, and that $20 not only entitles you to all of the activities that we have, but it entitles you to six copies of our magazine. You can also write us directly in Birmingham at 300 Office Park Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35. Two, two, three. And until next year in Portland, thanks for the ride. And we'll see you down the road.